Well, praise the Lord. I kind of miss the old days when we could run the aisles. I could be a runner, I think. I could, I could do that. <laughs> well, we're looking at Acts chapter 2. Thank you for participating in uh, this study uh, through these Sundays. And uh, I don't know, I was going to say we've kind of gotten bogged down in verse 42, but uh, maybe it isn't getting bogged down at all. But we're uh, kind of hovering around verse 42 because there are uh, four great ideas that are being presented to us in verse 42, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and we're walking through the second idea, and we've got two more to go just to get through that verse. He is presenting us with uh, the activities that uh, the early church was involved in, their focus and what they were all about. And it is a phenomenal passage indeed. Let's look at, uh, let's read at Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had needed. Context is Pentecost. Um, if uh, anybody goes out of here and says, you know, every Sunday all you talk about is Pentecost, you're always referring to Pentecost, seems to be your hobby horse, seems to be what you're focused on, uh, that's not true. What we've been trying to relate to you is that Pentecost is not just an event, as the crucifixion is not an event, as the resurrection is not an event, as the ascension of Jesus is not an event that if you could see all of those together as the event. That's really important. That way it's not just, well, you guys are all into the cross. Well, yeah, we are, but it isn't just the cross. It's the, what would the cross be without the resurrection? And, well, you're just into the resurrection. Well, what would the resurrection be without the ascension? And, well, you're just into the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. What would that be without Pentecost? See, all of this is one big deal of what God is trying to get done in our lives. And Pentecost is the opening of the door and stepping through into the room, so it's kind of the climax of the whole thing. It's kind of the kicking your shoes off and leaning back in the, in the armchair. It's kind of, whoa, we have, we've made a an, uh, a, a, an arrival here. Uh, you're saying, well, I thought uh, going to heaven, I thought the second coming was the climax of this whole thing. No, the intimacy with him is what this is all about. Heaven will come and it'll be an expansion of that, but the real deal here is all about what he wants to do in terms of intimacy and literally being within you. Um, back in the early days of ministry when we were constantly dealing with teens and all through evangelism dealing with teens, uh, you can't talk to teens, you know, normal. You gotta... So we developed what we called then, this was back in the 60s, 1860. <laughs> we, we, we did these things called raps. Now you can't use that word because it isn't raps anymore. Raps aren't raps, but it was discussion. So you get this board thing and you write questions on it and you begin to discuss with them and try to guide them through their discussion. And we'd write this question, what is a Christian? And a second one is likened to it, are there any really? Two questions, are there, what is a Christian? And are there any really? Interesting, every teen group, didn't matter when, didn't matter where, didn't matter what section of the country, any teen group you come into and ask that question, what is a Christian? Come on, respond. What is a Christian? Come on, respond. They'd raise their hand. We'd get the response. We'd begin to list things. They would all say the same thing, every one of them. Nobody ever messed up the discussion. What is a Christian? You go to church. What is a Christian? You pray. What is a Christian? One who reads his Bible. What is a Christian? One who witnesses. What is a Christian? Do you realize that all of those things are what Christians do, but not what a Christian is? Because you can do all those things and not be a Christian. <laughs> right? So this is not just reshaping your lifestyle that we're dealing with. 
Well, what is a Christian? Well, the name, the name itself is a dead giveaway. Christian. It begins with Christ and has an I-A-N on the end. And if you take the A out and put it in front of the Christ, you've got A-Christ, and what do you have left? I-N, A-Christ-N. So the name's a dead giveaway. So a Christian is what? The very essence of Jesus Christ indwelling the human life. You are a Christian because you have another person beside yourself living inside of you, and his name is Jesus. And when you got him, you're a Christian. When you're not, you're out of here. That's the whole deal, which is Pentecost. Well, no, it's crucifixion. Well, yeah, it's a resurrection. Well, it's also the ascension. Well, it's the whole deal because this is all that he's after in your life is that he would come and actually indwell you and be within you. The intimacy with him is the secret. Now, Peter got up to explain this. And in verse 14 down through verse 39, he gives this phenomenal sermon that just tells you exactly what I just got done telling you. His whole sermon is about Jesus and Jesus coming to indwell you. And he says, the problem with the whole thing is you messed it up big time because you crucified Christ. Why did you crucify Christ? Because your culture told you to. Why did you crucify Christ? Because your traditions led you to that. Why did you crucify Christ? Because your ceremonies brought you into that. Well, didn't God give our traditions? Didn't God give our law? Didn't God set up the Israelite nation? Yes, but you got so out of hand with that and so stuck on that thing that when Jesus literally showed up, the fulfillment of that whole thing, your culture wouldn't put up with that. And you literally nailed him. So he climaxes this whole discussion with, get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. Whatever the culture is that you're in that has become your reference point instead of him, get out of it. Whatever your culture is that's literally surrounded you and brought you into the crucifixion of Christ, get out of it while you can. Whatever your environment that's literally formed you and shaped you and brought you into the destruction and the crucifixion of Christ, Get out of it while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. Get out now. So obviously, if there's going to be any salvation in your life, you're going to have to be picked up, pulled out, and put into something new. So there is a subtraction, he says, verse 41, and there is an addition that must take place. It isn't just getting out that matters. It's getting in that really counts. In fact, he spins from verse 41 down through verse 47 discussing what you get into. So the get out of is only a brief statement at the beginning of the paragraph, which is verse 40, and he literally brings you into this, oh, you've got to be added into, and he gives this whole discussion on what you are going to get into. We've gone over this, but we've got to do it again because it's really important. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. Now, you remember there is a subject and verb. There is a verb, brother, that's not translated in that statement. It's the third person imperfect verb of a me. It's great, isn't it? Which is a state of being. In the first person, it would be translated, I am. Here it would be translated, they were. It's a state of being. So the whole emphasis of verse 42 is on the state of being, not activities, the state of being, not what they were doing, the state of being, not the performances, the state of being, the whole focus of the verse. Are you getting this? The whole focus of verse 42 is, is the attitude of the state of being in which they are dwelling. Well, what is this state of being? He gives this verb, which is a participle, which acts like an adjective and modifies the state of being. Continued steadfastly. It's in the imperfect tense, which tells you it can be translated kept on. So the idea is, oh, they're in this state of being, And do you know what this state of being is like? They were continually, steadfastly staying in this state of being. They were keeping on in this state of being. That they were dwelling in a state of being that was just one characteristic of the state of being is that they were hungering and desiring and 
after and focused on and giving themselves to and wouldn't back off and this was their passion and always talking about and always focused on and just after this thing and couldn't get it out of their mind and just dwelled on it and when they went to bed at night they thought about it and when they got up in the morning they thought about it and they were just into this this state of being what became their life see they've been picked up out of this state of being and they've been put into another state of being see over here in this cultural environment in which they had found themselves the state of being the reference point was the law the reference point was the activities the reference point was the Jewish tradition and culture they were they were that was their whole that's why they crucified Christ because he wasn't their state of being they've now been removed from that and planted into the state of being where Jesus is now their reference point he is the one around which everything revolves he is the lens through which they see everything he is the driving force that indwells them he's the moving heart of their being they're they're all wrapped up they've gotten so intimate this outside god has actually come to live inside of them and he has become their new culture he's become their thought process he's become the he's become the very movement of their lives they have been removed from this culture into a new state of he's their new location and it's so biblical, folks. Paul in the book of Ephesians talked about how we are literally sitting in Christ. That God reached out and grabbed a hold of a dead Jesus and yanked him from the dead and said, hey, I can't have my son dead and yanked him from the dead and brought resurrected life to him and said, well, what am I going to do with you? He said, oh, I'm going to sit you at my right hand and plop Jesus down right at the right hand of the Father. And there Jesus sits on the throne of the kingdom, ruling the kingdom at the right hand of the Father. And then he looked down and saw you and said, oh, man, I can't have this. You're dead in a doornail too. So he reached down, grabbed a hold of you, dead in your trespasses and sin, grabbed a hold of you yanked you out of that death brought resurrected life to your inner being filled you with himself literally began to generate quicken you from the deep internal of your being and pulled you out and said well what am i going to do with you he said i think i'm going to set you at my right hand oh i can't do that jesus is there ah oh, you both can sit there wham and you're sitting in jesus and he's your new location as the culture in which you've come from has been your location and shaped your thought process and determined how you viewed things and your experience of the past and your customs have all been around which you revolved and determined your lifestyle and how you approached everything as that has been your cultural environment get out of that get out of that while you can man and be planted into a new location and the new location is jesus and they lived in that state. Now, the reason we've gone over that again is because that state, because they were in that state of being, because that was their condition inside, oh, you know what happened? That began to flow into some activities, but the activities aren't the deal. In fact, there's four of them, but that's not the big deal. So the four activities become the big deal, then we begin to set up the four activities and think if we do the activities, we will have made it. No, it's the state of being. The four activities could have been five. The four activities could have been three. The th four activities could have been six, seven. It, no, they could have, no, the, four, the activities are not the deal. It's the state of being that's the deal. You're planted in him. Now, because you're in him, obviously there's going to be activities. I mean, there's always activities. I mean, if you've got life, you're going to move. There's going to be activities. So that we don't do anything. It isn't that we're lazy. It isn't, well, we'll just let Jesus do everything. Well, no. What are you talking about? He's come to indwell me, and he is doing everything. Well, he's not doing everything. Well, yeah, he's doing everything. Well, no. Well, we're doing it together because we're in a state of being whereby we become one, and he's flowing through me. And the state of being that began to spill out, in this case, ended up to be four. Now, we've been walking through those four. The first one is, verse 42, which we've already talked about, the apostles' doctrine. The word doctrine literally is better translated teaching. So it's the apostles' teaching. 
We spent one whole Sunday just talking about what were the apostles teaching. In other words, what, what were they listening to? What were they studying? What was being revealed to them? Oh, it was Jesus. <laughs> That's all they talked about. You go through the book of Acts, and the whole deal is about Jesus. But it wasn't just Jesus, the concept. Jesus, the idea. Jesus, the historical character. Jesus, the one who did parables, who told parables and did miracles. No, it wasn't just Jesus. It was Jesus, the real live guy. It was Jesus, the one raised from the dead who's here now. It was the Jesus that you can in, get involved in. It's the Jesus who wants to indwell you. It's the Jesus who's alive at this moment and wants to embrace you. And it's not some Jesus idea theology. It's not some vision Jesus. It's not some far out Jesus. It's not take a pill and see Jesus. It's Jesus is here. The real, live, resurrected from the dead Jesus. That was their whole emphasis. And everything they talked about was that Jesus and the embrace of that Jesus in your life. The apostles' doctrine and teaching. They got into that, hungering to know Jesus. Now, the second one is what we want to dwell on today, and it's the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. By the way, we call the apostles' doctrine belief in Jesus. And the second one, in my in my translation, is fellowship. And you say, oh, good, fellowship, potlucks. Oh, we're going to have potlucks and hang out and play rook. Whoa, that's going to be great. I'm into that. <laughs> oh, mercy. We're calling this business with Jesus. And I want to try to describe that to you and convince you that I'm not off the wall that the Greek word that's translated fellowship here really isn't potluck and hanging out and eating pizza. That's not what they did. It has to do with business. The idea of the word fellowship is partners. This is so awesome. Oh, should take two Sundays on this. This is so awesome. Or maybe just one long Sunday. Never mind. So... The word fellowship is literally the idea of partners. It's the Greek word koinonia. Now, again, back when I was coming up through the ranks back in the 60s, we had this, this, this was a buzzword in the church, this Greek word. Uh, we just, everybody was using the koinonia word. Oh, everybody was talking the koinonia. Uh, we'd come to church and somebody would say, oh, we're going to go and have koinonia. Well, good. In fact, we named Sunday school classes after it. This was the koinonia Sunday school class, which was about fellowship, they thought. But the Greek word for koinonia, which is so significant, literally the root word where it comes from is the idea of business. It's the idea of a king who would, or a, a top, a, a representative of the king who would come to your town and you would go and counsel with him, have counsel with him, and get instruction from him in regard to business that you were going to be involved in. He would give you business advice. Now that word developed into this koinonia idea which has to do with partnership. Let me give you some examples. You don't even have to look these up. We're going to give them to you. In Luke chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus is searching out his disciples, and he comes to James and John, and here's what it says about James and John. Look at this thing. So also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners, koinonia, with Simon. Now, if you get into that passage, you'll find out, and as you already know, they were fishing partners. James and John, sons of Zebedee and Peter, went into business, fishing business together. This was not, let's get our, let's get our uh, fishing poles and let's, let's, let's go fishing and see what we can catch. Wasn't that, this was their livelihood. Peter put in some money, man. James and John put in their money. Come on, they bought boats. They had nets, son. 
They had, hey, I want to see you here at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. I'm telling you. Why? Because we're going out fishing and you're a partner in this business and we got to make some money. They split the profit. Why? Because they're business partners. That's the word koinonia. They were partners. Now, Paul takes that concept and says, let me expand that concept for you. Yes, James, John, and Peter were fishing partners, business partners, fishing business partners. But let me expand that for you and talk to you on a spiritual level. And he, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, here's what he said. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner, koinonia, partner and fellow worker concerning you. Titus was a young man. He was working in the church, of, obviously, at Corinth. And as he was working at the church in Corinth, as they were uh, a part of the church, uh, you know how older people are about young people. Oh, you don't. Okay, that's fine. They were talking behind, why don't those young people, what they got earrings in their ear for, what on earth, you know, they were talking that. And Paul came down on them and said, don't you dare talk about Titus. Don't you, don't, hey, you leave Titus alone. Because when you mess with Titus, you're messing with me because we are partners. In the business, the eternal business of your soul. We're partners, business partners in the kingdom. It's really strong. So he's moved from fishing business, making money, to spiritual enterprise and business where we've linked, Titus and I have linked and become koinonia partners in business with Jesus for the salvation of your soul. Let me take you another place. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. Paul is talking to the, to the church at Corinth and dealing with problems, as you know. And as he dealt with these problems, one of them that came up, and we probably talked about this before, but one of them is this business of eating. Did you ever consider eating a problem? But it was what they were eating. It isn't eating that's the problem. It's what they were eating. And it was meat offered to idols. See, there were these pagan churches that were constantly offering sacrifices to their pagan gods. And they would take the meat, and meat was really expensive, you understand. So if you went to the grocery store, it's high-priced stuff, and you didn't get much of it. So meat was Hard to get for your family when you got 15 teenagers. So this expensive meat, you couldn't afford to buy it very often. But there was this cheaper meat. It was used meat. <laughs> Meaning it had been offered as a sacrifice to this idol. And you could buy it at half price. And aren't you a steward of God's money? And you don't want to be foolish? And if you don't spend as much on meat, you can give more to the church? Hallelujah. <laughs> so would you, when you went to the store, see this expensive meat and see this other meat that's half price, which looks just as good and tastes just as good? Duh. Why wouldn't you buy the cheap meat? That only makes sense. But this brought division in the church because some said, you can't do that. That's not spiritual. And others said, well, hey, I'm a steward of God's money. And they were arguing about it. Paul writes about it. He says, let me talk to you about this meat thing. Let me talk to you about meat offered to idols. And I'm not saying, he says, that idols are anything. No, idols aren't anything, man. Idols, what are idols? I mean, they're a piece of wood, a piece of stone. Somebody carved a thing out. I mean, come on, idols, the, idols don't mean anything. Take the piece of wood and burn it. I mean, come on, no big deal. Use it in your fireplace. So what? It's an idol. And meat, is meat any big deal? No, meat is meat. 
Hey, whether it stood before, whether it was before an idol or whether it wasn't before an idol, what difference does it make? Meat is meat, idols are idol, no big deal. But he said, that isn't the issue. And he gave these verses. Here's what I'm telling you, he says, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Listen to this. I do not want you to have fellowship. Koinonia. I don't want you to be business partners. I don't want you to link. I don't want you to put your money into and be a part of and be a part of the enterprise of. I don't want you to be in business with demons. And he says, listen to me, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake, koinonia, be in business with the Lord's table and the table of demons at the same time. So this is not about, well, what difference is, no. This is not about, well, meat is meat, no. This is not about, well, we just went out for supper, no. This is about what? This is a spiritual deal where you are literally linking and becoming partners with the demonic force. No, don't do that. You are to be partners with God. Business partners. And if you say, well, business partners, what, what exactly does that mean, business partners with God? Oh, he says, I'll tell you. And for instance, 2 Peter verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 4, the wonderful verse. We quote it all the time. Peter said this. Listen to this. Oh, try to, try to contain yourself. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you might be partakers, business partners with the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through, through lust. He said, do you know what's going on in Christianity? You are literally becoming a business partner. Now, what's a business partner? Oh, I put my money in on it, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm an A. This is my career. I mean, whoa, I get up in the morning at 6 o'clock to get involved in this thing, man. Wow. Hey, all my day. And I, hey, I bring my briefcase home at night, son. Why? I got the, I got the material in the briefcase. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm linked with the divine. Hey, I go into the big conference table. We sit together and put our heads together. We we wrestle with the problems. I'm in on what God's doing. God is planning and plotting, and I'm in on the planning and the plotting. God is linked with me. I've linked with him. He and I are business partners, man. And if he succeeds, it's because he's going to have me by his side. And if I succeed, I'm going to have him by my side. And he, I, he and I are business partners. Whoa! Isn't that phenomenal? Who on earth would want to work for Cracker Barrel their entire life? Who would want to just do construction all their life? End up having arthritis and can't drive a nail anymore because they can't hold a hammer. Now, don't quit your job, brother. But this is, this is, yeah, sure. Um, but don't you understand? We have linked with the divine nature and he has literally indwelt us and we are business partners with God in an overwhelming enterprise of the evangelization and winning of our world. Do you know what we've, we have, we've come to Lebanon, Tennessee, man, and God has indwelt us, and we're in this building that he gave us, and whoa, what are we doing? We're in business, man. We're in the enterprise of the divine life of God spilling to our community. That's us. We're partners. 
See, they had been removed from their cultural environment of the Jewish setup, had been yanked out of that thing, had been placed right in the middle of Christ, and the resurrected Jesus had come. They'd signed the contract. They were hired on the spot. They gave a resume, and God took them on, and they were business partners with the divine in the winning of their world. How deep, how intense is this partnership, this business partnership? Well, the writer of the Hebrews says, let me give you an example of what it's really like. And this is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He says, in as much then, Hebrews 2, 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken, koinonia, of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Let me lay that out for you. Oh, he says, you know what's been going on? Hey, come on. You, you got sense enough to know this. Your child is born. Your uh, your son, he, he, he's, whoa. Do you know, he didn't have any choice. He, 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 is in, he is in business with you. He's linked. He has your DNA, but it's bigger than DNA. He has, he has your looks. He walks like you. He talks like you. He, he grows up in your home. He, he's, he's, uh, he, in fact, your dad becomes his grandpa. Do you think he had a choice on that? All the skeletons in your closet become his skeletons. And your whole family and the enterprise and business of your whole family and who you are and all the horse thieves. That's what I got in my family. All the horse thieves. All the guys that went to Canada instead of serving in the Civil War. All of those guys become a part of his life. He's sharing your whole entire heritage and everything you are. He links. And brother, when he gets in trouble at school, you're in trouble. When he ends up in jail, you end up going to jail. Why? Because he's not just some guy. He's your partner. He says, now, if you got that, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Let me lay this on you. Do you know what God did? He leaped off of his throne and became your child took on your flesh and blood and all the skeletons in your closet became his and all of your problems became his problems and all of your battles became his battles and all the rot and ruin of your life became the rot and ruin of his life and he so joined you in partnership that he ended up in jail with you. He has your addictions. He is in walking where you walk. He has literally taken on the entire sin of your being. Well, why would he do that? Oh, so he could give you his divine nature and you could become a partner. You could get out of this and get into this. That's how tight the partnership is. Now, that's the introduction. <laughs> Are we in trouble? Oh... You say, whoa, if that's the truth, I want to be in on that. And we'll rip right through this. If that's the 
the truth. I want to be in on that kind of partnership. There's a downside. Read the fine print. Well, if I could be business partners with God, whoa, that would mean, man, I'd always have the best car. I'd be wealthy. I'd probably shorten my nose. Whoa, whoa, I want in on that. There's a downside. There's a downside. You've got to be aware of the downside. Well, what's the downside? Well, see, when I get into partnership with him, oh, and he fills me, and now I'm a partner with God in the divine nature, when that happens... I become a partner with you. <laughs> Doesn't that suck? <laughs> I don't want to be a partner with you. Now, there's going to be a sermon on each one of these as we develop, uh, as the passage develops in the truth and as we begin to walk through it. But he begins to tell you what that partnership between the believers looks like. Look at verse uh, 44. Now, all who believed were together. There was oneness with all. They were together. Now, he's not, come on, he's not promoting communal living. Come on, use your brain. There were 3,000 of them got saved and joined the 120. So there was 3,120 of them. They didn't all live in one big building. Right? I mean, come on. You got to see that. So he's not, he's not even suggesting that they were together in communal living. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not even in the passage. But they were together. And when, uh, again, you've got this, I don't know why they don't do this. Never mind. There is a verb in this that's not translated. And again, it's this a me thing that is in the third person, they were idea, which we just went through. That's also here. In other words, the emphasis of this, the deal is it's a state of being. They were together, meaning what? They were in a state of being. It wasn't that they all lived in the same place. It wasn't that they, no. But if, see, if you are filled with Jesus and you are on the, in on the great enterprise, oh, if you're in on his heart and what he wants, you want, and man, you are on the, in the enterprise of the divine God and you're partners with him and I'm filled with him and I'm a partner with him, do you know what that makes us? We're not in competition. We're working for the same boss. In fact, we're not just working for the same boss. We're filled with the same boss. In fact, the same boss and the same enterprise and the same job and what we're trying to get done, you and I are both working on the same deal. So we are in the same state of being. That's the emphasis that he's telling us here. Man, that... that See, it isn't a matter of, well, why don't you come to church? See, that, that's not the deal. The deal is, well, why wouldn't you want to come? Why don't you hunger to come? Why don't you win the lost? Well, that's not the issue. See, I can stand up here and make you feel guilty because you haven't won anybody to Jesus. That's not the point. The point is, why wouldn't you want to win somebody to Jesus? Why wouldn't you be banging on doors? Why wouldn't you be pouring your life out? Why wouldn't you be doing that? Why wouldn't you be rolling up your sleeves? Why wouldn't you be aggressive about this? Why? Because, hey, you're in on the enterprise, man. You're partners in the state of being. And they felt that. They were together. So it's oneness with all. Now, it's not only oneness with all, it's oneness for all. Because as you read on in verse 44, it says, all who believe were together and had all things in common. Well, that's a communistic socialism. <laughs> no, it's, they're not even suggesting. No, they didn't sell everything. He's not talking about everybody sold everything. 
No, they didn't have to sell everything. Nobody was requiring anybody to sell anything. Nobody wants you to sell anything. Keep what you got. They're not suggesting that. Well, you say Ananias and Sapphira, man, they dropped dead over that thing. They didn't sell it. They lied. It wasn't the issue of selling everything. It was lying about it. So you, got, you drop dead over lying, but you don't drop dead because you didn't sell everything. So we're not, come on. See, that's not in the passage. It says they had all things in common, which means what? They renounced ownership. That's a mouthful. Oh, he's filled me. I know. Oh, I'm a partner with God. And everything I have is in on this one job. I'm going out and mortgage my house. I'm, sell, I, I'm, 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 I'm driving a cheaper car. My whole financial structure is going to bend itself towards this one single enterprise. Man, if we don't make it in this business, we're all going down the tubes. That's exactly what they did. It isn't that they sold everything. It's that they renounced ownership so that everything was available for the accomplishment of the overwhelming enterprise. See, no one can, relinqu can relinquish something. No one, no one can relinquish materialism. No one can give up stuff unless they decide, unless they turn it loose. Unless you renounce ownership. See, you have to relinquish ownership in order to give things away. See, if I've got a $10 bill, I have to say, I don't own that $10 bill in order to give it to you. Now, if I own that $10 bill and I give it to you, then I'm going to watch that $10 bill and see what you do with it. Because <laughs> I still own it, and when you don't spend it the way I want to, I'm going to... You haven't renounced ownership. See, before you give the $10 bill, you better say, this really isn't mine anyway. <laughs> well, where did you get it? Well, I worked hard. Where'd you get the ability to work hard? Well, I got up out of bed. Where'd you get the ability to get up out of bed? Well, I'm the one who thought up the... Who gave you the brain to think? So you'll note in the passage, it was not only oneness with all, oneness for all, but oneness in all. Now down in verse 46, it says, they, so they continued daily with one accord. And that's one of my favorite, most favorite phrases in the New Testament, with one accord. It's two words put together, and we've talked about this because it shows up in Pentecost all the time. It's two words put together with one accord. There with one accord, two words put together. It's together and heavy breathing. They were together with heavy breathing. So they were continuing to get together and just breathing heavy. It's the word for passion. In other words, they had this passion. They had this burn. They had this, whoa. They had this, oh. They had this. They fought a lot in the early church over who was going to get to volunteer. Well, I want to do it. No, I want to do it. Well, I want to do it. Well, we got too many people who want to do this, so we can only have one. Well, some of you sit down. What's it? And they had this passion, this burning passion. Why? Because they were, they were in on this enterprise thing, man. They were, they, were, they were in business. There was this, whoa. They had, Jesus had captured them, and in this intimacy and this state of being, there was this, there was this whole enterprise of the winning of their world. In 70 years, they pulled it off. The winning of their whole world, and they burned with this one. They were partners with God. Looking for a job? I got one for you. Well, I, my resume, don't worry about it. I'm in with the boss. 
We can get you in. The pay is phenomenal. What's the hours like? All the time. <laughs> night and day, day and night. What's the benefits? Change lives. Yours and everybody else's. What am I going to get out of it? Family and intimacy and peace. Thank you for accepting my resume, Jesus. A guy who could tell it hardly tell the difference between up and down. A fellow who had no skills and no talents. Everybody else bypassed him. Principal looked at him and said, he'll never amount to anything. Thank you for accepting my resume. I don't know how to put all this together, God, but to be a son of God in on the family business. One of the boys. I'm not somebody on an assembly line. I'm not somebody down the road. I'm not a contractor. I'm in on the heart of the Father. Sitting around the big oak table discussing the amazing possibility what you want to do in my day. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, would you bring that reality to everyone in this building? Would you tell us this morning you do not get up and say, I need a hundred construction workers today. Just go get a bunch of them. That you've picked up the phone. You know my number. Better than that, you got in your car. You drove down and banged on my door. That you're here this morning. You got me out of bed. And every single one of you, you banged on our forehead and you yelled in our ear, you got to have us to accomplish the enterprise. God, don't let us waste our lives. Don't, don't let us just do jobs. Don't let us just have careers. Don't let us just work for some company capture us with your heart and in the intimacy of your person bring us into the wonder of in business with Jesus and Lord I can hardly I, I can hardly contain myself because I don't have to retire <laughs> about uh, moments of response. The boss is accepting applications this morning. If you're discouraged and uh, burned out and uh,
Why don't you get another job? Get a new job. Jesus wants to be partners with your life. Would you risk going into business with him? Would you relinquish ownership of your life? all your stuff sign up ah uh, be careful it'll cost you everything you got but what a partner what a partner moments of seeking